Excellent. I'm, I'm happy to introduce Dan Kirkendall. He is with NT Objectives. He manages their software development activities there. He has in the past been with Foundstone. Um, I'm happy to say I use their tools and find them quite useful. And he's also worked with Fortis in the past. He'll talk to us today about the latest generation of web applications and how they have changed the game. Dan, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, so I think people will probably still be filing in a little bit, but uh, we've got to get going because we've got lunch coming. So I'm going to try to go through this quickly because I know everybody's going to be anxious to get to lunch. <laughs> but uh, our key topic for today is really going to be about web apps and how things have been changing, the formats, and that sort of thing. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm currently the uh, co-CEO, CTO of NT Objectives. We do web application scanning. Uh, we've been, as a company, around for about 10 years uh, building NTO Spider, which is our core product. Uh, plus, I do some podcasting. Actually, on a podcast with Mike Farnham, the organizer of this conference, and um, do a bunch of open source development. Um, I'm going to kind of skip the stuff about the company. Stop by the booth. We're giving out the shirts. I think I'm, yeah, I'm wearing one here. So stop by the booth. And we can give you more information about our products. Uh, <clears throat> so this is basically the overview of what I'm going to go through. We're talking about what the current trends are in application security, uh, the importance that is really how important they're starting to become, what the focus is uh, really in the security industry, and how the applications have been, you know, kind of the legacy, they're what I call grand, granddad's apps. I'm going to kind of go through how those look in comparison with what's happening now, what some of the new, uh, the new applications, how they send their data, including mobile apps, um, and really the lack of defenses uh, involved. So why this all matters? Well, this is really becoming the focus. You know, most of the attacks are coming against the applications, most of the successful attacks. Um, SANS Institute says 60% of the total attacks are coming across the internet. <clears throat> what we're seeing is that there's legislation that is trying to help and standards like PCI, um, legislation around like HIPAA, Sarbanes-Oxley, those, those sort of regulations are coming into effect. But what we end up seeing is that 54% of the actual attacks are starting to happen against the web apps. But I guess the network guys have been securing things better, so the success rate of the, sto the stolen attacks are mostly coming from the app web applications. 92% of the actual stolen records are from the web applications, and, and that's really key here. This is where the activity is going. Right? This, the network layer has really been doing a good job of protecting itself. Uh, and here's the basic attacks that are really popular. The ones that, t that tend to work are things like cross-site scripting, and that's where you're basically using a trusted site to hack their users. Um, SQL injection is another major one where you're obviously able to get into the database behind the scenes, powering the web app. Um, there's information leakage, being able to get to data that you weren't supposed to, that sort of thing. Um, and these are, the, these are the main attacks that we see. Authentication bypasses is another key, uh, key issue uh, where you're able to get into areas of the application or to data that you weren't supposed to. So this is what it tends to look like uh, in the current applications. Behind the scenes, behind the, you know, what's happening behind the scenes in the browser. Hopefully you can see this okay. What we end up seeing is very simple attack structure, attack surface. Um, the, the name and value pairs are very simple. You see them on your URL on your web browser all the time. Right? In this example I've got the, you know, this page and ID equals four. Right? It's very simple. Uh, you know, our name equals rake over there. It's all very simple input format, right? It's a very well-defined and well-utilized format. Even when you're doing a post, when you're submitting a form, it's the same format, but instead, instead of sticking it on the URL, it's going to be sticking it in the post section of the HTTP header, right? So, you know, and this is normally stuff you see. This is actually why people often falsely think that a post is is more secure than a get because you're just not seeing it, but it's still there if you're looking at the traffic. So somebody sitting over your shoulder may not see what those values are, but um, 
that's not really the person you're generally worried about. Uh, the attack, inserting the attacks is pretty straightforward because you're going to put them in those well-defined areas. Right, here would be a cross-site scripting attack, uh, taking that, that example from the previous page where I had name equals rake. Now I'm going to take name equals rake and add a cross-site scripting payload. Very easy, very simple stuff. We've been doing this a long, long time. Um, I guess not everybody's been doing this, but us in the, in the AppSec space have been doing this forever. Uh, and what happens with these kind of attacks is, you know, I'm going to inject this, this HTML content, and then it's going to, and in this case some JavaScript, and it's going to end up showing up on the resulting response page. All right, and this is something I could then send that link to, uh, to somebody, they click on it, it's going to execute my code uh, from the trusted site. Right? So this is the stuff that we've been doing for a long time. You know, this is, you know, we're getting kind of older, or <laughs> I'm getting older, been doing this forever. And, and, you know, this is kind of the granddad's web apps and, and the attacks that have been going on for a long time. There's tools to help you find these issues, right? These classic, you know, granddad web app type of things, this, you know, web 1.0, whatever you want to call it, uh, there are good tools to help you find these issues. Right? Our, our product, NTO Spider, is one of them. There's AppScan, WebInspect, you know, there's Mavi Tuna. There's a ton of web scanners out there, uh, you know, all ranging in quality. There's source code review tools like Fortify, who I, I see out there. Uh, you know, there's good SaaS products out there that are decent at finding some of these issues and helping you, helping you identify them. There's good open source products and quasi nearly free tools like uh, Peros, Web Scarab, there's Burp, uh, and then there's the defensive tools. Because this format of these attacks are so straightforward, web app firewalls are able to kind of protect them because they can parse that format, tear it apart, find the, the values, and look for attack payloads in there. They can understand that. And they, they're, you know, they vary in effectiveness as well. But there are tools, and there's good resources to learn how to do this stuff. All right? There's good books and, and it's talked about at conferences a lot. Uh, but what we end up seeing here is things are moving forward on the development side of things. The way people build tools and build web applications has really been moving. So uh, what we see is the attack surface for a while, there was a little bit of you know, what we call Web 2.0, which is these ajax -y type of applications. Um, they certainly introduced some of these problems. Uh, but as we start moving forward, we're starting to get more layers on top of that. You know, we've got some of the HTML5 stuff, we've got Flash and Flex, uh, which uses um, AMF for a lot of its traffic. There's a lot more JSON traffic going on, um, the REST-based stuff, SOAP. There's all kinds of stuff sitting on top of our HTTP stack, right? And what we see, all the HTTP traffic, is no longer simple gets and posts. There's a lot more data now and structured in different ways. So, you know, we, the, the, as things move forward, we're going to continue having URLs and standard URL-based inputs and form inputs, but we're going to start getting a lot more of this execution in the browser uh, or execution by other applications that are going to be sending their traffic over the web. Mobile apps are a great example of that. We're seeing a ton of that. And most mobile apps are using like JSON for their traffic. That tends to be what I'm seeing. Uh, the, with these new applications, they're going to be exposed to the same kind of problems. Um, SQL injection, certainly. These back ends are going to be vulnerable. And this is what we really want to be talking about. There's going to be also, you know, cross-site scripting is still going to really be an issue. Uh, and it's interesting because now you're dealing with an application that is more dynamic in the browser and it's executing more stuff. And, and certainly it's going to get interesting with HTML5 and the local storage. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how we're going to be able to exploit that as, as we start digging into that. Um, you know, we're seeing new flaws that are becoming more and more effective as we have more XML based stuff, things like uh, XPath, and of course there's going to continue to be like LDAP and those sort of, sort of problems. Um, these things are changing and it's been interesting because you would hope that the security community or you know the, the people that are in the know 
would have a handle on this stuff. But you can even look at the OWASP top 10 and how it's evolved over the years to understand that we still don't understand. Us in, that are focused on web application security, we still have a hard time really deciding what's important. And, and you kind of see that as you know, even OWASP has had to change over the years and, and sort things out to uh, what's important. What do we focus on? Uh, it's kind of like you have to focus on everything <laughs> in a sense. Um, and largely this is because these new applications are changing the structure of how we do things. Uh, you know, instead of going, you know, we used to have a web browser that would go to a web server, it would do a whole bunch of parsing, and then it would go and talk to application services and databases behind the scenes. Some of these newer rich clients, right, some of the, uh, the SOAP-based stuff or the uh, mobile apps, they're really sending their data almost more directly to the, the, the real application servers and getting closer to the databases because they're just kind of using these APIs that are developed. And they may still hit the web server, but it's a very thin layer on the web server. So they get more direct access to the core resources. And, and that's where it gets kind of scary. So instead of having this nice structured format, things are getting more dynamic. The interfaces are different. People are defining their own interfaces. Um, they're not maybe using JSON. They've built their own REST-based uh, format. Because of all of this, it really becomes hard to attack these things uh, with tools. And you know, these, these formats are fairly obfuscated to the tools. So what I'm going to kind of go through is show you what I mean by this, and then, and then just hopefully give you an understanding of why none of the tools out there are really helping you, especially the, the commercial tools. And, and that includes our own. Um, this is just a problem that we're having a hard time solving. You know, with our future version, we're, you know, and I'll talk about that briefly, we are starting to solve some of this stuff. But uh, it's a hard problem. So here's what it looks like when you're dealing with a Flash application. I'm going to talk about AMF here for a sec. When you're dealing with a Flash app, all right, it's got a little Swift file. You guys have probably seen that sort of thing. A little embedded in the browser is going to be an object call, and it's going to load up a Flash app. The Flash app is then, when it wants to talk to a server, it usually uses AMF, which is Adobe's messaging format. And so you load it up, and what you're going to see behind the scenes, if you were to capture this traffic, is it's going to be sending this garbage down below. It's going to be sending a po uh, 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 an HTTP request, and it's going to be sending a post, and in that post space, instead of name equal value pairs, it's going to be sending this data block. Right? So you can see the content type is application AMF, uh, and it's going to have this binary data. I can't just directly modify that binary data because it's going to mess up the checksums and it's just not going to work. So when you look at that traffic, or you know, and a scanner looks at this traffic, or a, a web app firewall looks at this traffic, has no idea what to do with it. It's just going to send it through. But there are ways to decompile this stuff. AMF is a well-defined format, and there's a lot of libraries out there to decode it. So what I'm going to do here is show you, this is a little video of me doing this attack, where this is actually, in, in that browser window, it looks like a regular web form, but it's not. It's actually a little AMF applet. And I'm submitting my credentials. And it's not going to let me in, right? When I did it, when I did a good login, it said successful. When I failed, it it told me I failed. So I'm actually going to use Burp proxy here, and what we can see is that that traffic, my file not playing. Here we go. Uh, there are tools that help you decode this stuff. Why is this not playing? Oh, there we go. Okay, so with with Burp, I can actually decode the data nodes, and I'm not sure why this. Video is not playing properly. Let me uh, let me try this way. Yeah, there's the junk data, it, and so Burp Proxy has the ability to let you decode this uh, this the data nodes. So it actually breaks it down into its object, and so you can kind of navigate this thing, and you can see the data nodes. Here we got admin and the password junk. And what's great with Burp is it'll allow you to actually take and see the response, right? It says that I, did, I failed to, to log in. And then I could actually send this over to Repeater 
and, and then expand it out there and modify the data nodes. Right? So I'm going to actually modify the, the password of junk and, and put in a little uh, SQL injection attack. Okay? Normal SQL injection stuff, you know, a simple OR1 equals 1 type of attack. And it's going to rebuild a, an AMF packet that's going to go out, send it, and actually now you can see that we got ourselves logged in. Right? So this is all still very attackable. But people aren't doing it most of the time because it's not something that you're, that you're used to dealing with. So, you know, and, this, and the, the web scanners and, you know, various tools out there don't make this particularly easy, right? You have to really know, and, and even Burp's AMF encoder and decoder doesn't always work. Um, it's a little flaky with some of the versions of AMF. So, that's one format. JSON's another. And JSON has a couple different ways it can be done. JSON is a what we call a serialized array. Um, and so it can actually be very nested. You can have things, you know, basically lists within lists within lists, and it can, it can all be structured that way. But it's a great data format. It's very easy to parse and easy to generate. Uh, usually what we see behind the scenes is I kind of spread it out so you can kind of see all the different values there. Normally it's going to be shown as one line, like down below here. But again, Scanners aren't really handling this very well. Web app firewalls aren't handling this. Um, and here's a little video. The videos aren't playing right, so I'm going to do them a little more directly. All right. I don't know why it's not zoomed in, but hopefully you can see it. What we got here is a little simple web app that's using JSON behind the scenes. This is grabbing some news, uh, but then we also have a little stock feature. So it's going to do a stock ticker lookup. And what we're going to see behind the scenes is some JSON traffic. Okay, so right here it's a very simple one. In this one, it's a very very simple. It's it's got uh, yeah, index index is the parameter name and the value of one. Right, it's a very simple little bit of JSON uh, values. And when you send that, it, the back end is going to be parsing it, and it's going to look up a record. Okay, very simple. I could change that now. I'm going to go ahead and do a, the same kind of SQL injection attack. I'm going to send it over to repeater. Still using burp here. Uh, and I'm going to change it. I'm going to toss in a little SQL injection attack. Yeah, there you go. Or one equals one. Oh, okay. First I put a little single quote. And I get a SQL error back. All right? So I'm just kind of testing it out. Uh, so I know that it's connecting to a database and making a request based on that value. All right? So the application is going to parse that and deal with it. Um, then I'll go and put a, a, a more extensive SQL injection attack in there. Here we go. There we go. There's my OR1 equals 1. Oh, there we go. That's a lot better. All right. And now it's going to end up showing me all the records in, the da in that table. Right, so it just bypassed, you know, doing one record at a time, and it's going to show me a whole list. And a lot of JSON backends will do that. It's a pretty standard thing that they'll do if they get multiple records. They just use their existing structure, and so I can get in there. I could do cross-site scripting the same kind of way because this is going to take that JSON trap, that the, the response from that JSON request, and generate content for the web page. Um, I could still do. I can even do cross-site scripting. Jump ahead a little bit. Uh, well, it's going to have to go through it. Oh yeah, there, I put the cross-site scripting up on the top. Uh, you know, and I just did that on the URL. Again, it's going to be sending that traffic, it's going to be just as vulnerable, same type of attacks, but the format is different. The way you have to, where you have to insert the payload keeps changing uh, with these different formats. Uh, JSON has an XML format as well. It looks like this. Same basic thing, um, same basic structure, just in an XML format. Um, and it's the, just as attackable, same kind of thing. Um, SOAP. With, uh, with WSDLs, or SOAP has kind of a, a structure that gives you a definition of the service behind the scenes. And so SOAP is going to give you this structure, and based on this, I can actually take this data and put it into a tool 
so I can generate soap, soap attacks. Um, soap is kind of structured and it's a, a very nice well-defined format and there's a basic envelope and then it, it has the same thing. You're going to be calling a function and what you see here is ID and the value of one, right? It's an XML format so it's going to have the value and I'm running the get product info uh, method in this case, right? So I can attack this the same way, right? As these applications, this one actually plays okay here. All right, so this is a tool called WS Scanner uh, from Blue Infy. Great little utility for doing this, but it again allows me to take this and um, see my methods. It's going to load up the WSDL for me and, and parse it out and show me my methods and allow it me to more easily uh, build up an attack. But I can do these attacks against these SOAP interfaces. So what I'm going to do here, uh, yeah, there's the routine. And right now it's going to be, I'm going to, and tell it to want to create a, an attack here. Um, and by default, the way this does it is it, it it's going to go into its listening mode and send the request. And you should see it show up here. It'll show what the functions are. Yeah, get product info. All right, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. No. Let's see if I can play this video a little better. Yeah, so first I'm going to get the object, and it's going to start off by giving me a value of a star. So I'm going to put a one in there and send it. And what I get back is, and yeah, here goes the response. Let's scroll down. Um, what we're going to see is it's going to give me data about a movie here, or it's, yeah, a Toy Story, Bugs Life. It's giving me some, some data. Oh, this is the object. If I switch over to the, uh, to the info, what I'm going to get back in my response is some uh, information about one of the videos. This is a, like the back end. The back end is a video website, right? So it's going to Finding Nemo. That's my first my first record. I can go in there and change it and get different records. Uh, but now I can also I can also yeah let's see I think change it to a two. Send it. Let's skip a little ahead. Uh, we've got Bend It Like Beckham is the second record in this in this database. Um, I can toss in a or one equals one type of attack, right? So if you can see there on the top section, it says two or one equals one, right? Uh, so I can actually see I'm putting in my attack payload, same kind of thing. As long as the back end doesn't validate the data properly, which is usually the case, um, I can go ahead and do my same attack. And what I'm going to see now is a series of records, right? So it's giving me a list of records. So I'm starting to see where I'm able to inject these attacks, see what the different records are in that table. Um, you know, this is, you know, certainly once you get these type of locations that are vulnerable, you want to dig in deeper. Um, but this is all a very manual process, right? I can do all the, you know, the stuff with 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 AMF, with JSON, with SOAP. All of these same type of attacks are still coming into play, but. Uh, and people are getting more creative. I mean, the attacks are getting more interesting. Uh, the f where I can inject these attacks, this is getting interesting. I mean, it's getting to be fun stuff. Um, you know, some of the new attacks are interesting, like clickjacking, where uh, it's kind of a, a play on some of the cross-site scripting attacks, where I'm going to inject stuff because I want to make you uh, perform a certain function. I might need you to click on something, and to do that, I need to kind of trick you. Right, so this is a very simple example of, of a clickjacking attack. Uh, as we start getting into these new formats, what I'm seeing here is, you know, I want, I, I, there's this dialogue that's going to show up on the screen. Do you want to send email to all users? Right, and normally you're going to say no. Um, so what I may do is actually create a, a, a floating div or something that's going to be on the page that's going to sit on top. And so I'll create it where it'll have a different question. Right, do you want a free iPad? And I'll leave that, I'll leave one of the spaces blank in there. And that's going to be what I'm, uh, you're going to actually end up seeing, right? So when I merge them together, now of course they're kind of superimposed, you're not going to actually see the send email to all users. All you're going to see is, do you want a free iPad, right? And you click on yes, and now you've just performed the function that I wanted you to. All right, so things are getting interesting. People are attacking these back ends differently. Even the attacks on the browsers are getting, are getting more interesting and more creative. 
uh, mobile apps use a lot of these formats, right? The mobile apps these days on the smartphones are amazing little web apps. Uh, or they're, they're not exactly web apps in, in the traditional sense. They're not always browser driven. But they are going back to a server and getting data, right? You know, the Google phone, everything is constantly hitting the network and grabbing new updates to your contacts and all kinds of stuff. To do that, it's using these different formats. It's using things like JSON and sending out its request to the back end and getting data back. Right? There, you know, MJ Keith sitting over here. Last year, he did the Pwn on the Go talk about hacking Bump, and it, Bump was using JSON traffic, right? Okay. Right, and the short of what the, what he did in this and this is one of the things that inspired me to start digging into a lot of this, was that uh, basically, if you're familiar with Bump, it's a little application where you can bump two phones together and it's going to send each other the contacts, the contact information, right? So instead of trading business cards, you bump these things and it, it transfers uh, the contact information. Well, the way it does that is by matching you up based on your location and timing. Right? When did you bump and where are you? Right? And so what it doesn't actually send phone to phone, it actually sends up to a server. Okay? If I get this right, or if I get this wrong, correct me. But it sends it up to the server. So what's going to happen is the uh, the bump backend is going to get two requests. And two requests come in at the same time and based on GPS coordinates and time, it's going to match them up and then it's going to send them both, you know, each other's information. And um and this becomes really interesting because, and kind of fun, because you can basically, what, what I think what you had done, I actually kind of wrote my own, I wrote a little Perl script that did this. Um, but I just sat there and what he found is that the, what he had come up with is that when it figures out the GPS coordinates, it's actually asking the phone. All right, so the phone's sending up its GPS coordinates, but it's also sending up its accuracy reading. Right, and GPS coordinates are, you know, usually accurate to three meters or whatever it's going to be. Um, but it wasn't setting real boundary conditions on how accurate that was. All right, so the phone would decide. So with my little Perl script I wrote, I was able to set it up, I actually put it over the Moscone and, and made it accurate to within a mile. Right, so I kind of took the whole Moscone center right, and just had this thing running in a script and I would see people coming up and I would get pairs, I'd get matched up. Right, because mine's just fast and it's going fast, and you could potentially beat both of them. And what I tried to figure out, and I, I had difficulty with, but what you can kind of do is um, I'm trying to remember how my developer did this, but he, the way he he structured it was it would uh, it would catch both of them, right? So let's say you know Paul's here and David's here, they bump each other. Uh, what would happen is our script would catch both of them. Right? And say, okay, I've got these two. I would say, yes, I want that. I was the person I bumped. And, and I wouldn't, and they would get back kind of junk contact information. Right? Or I would just not fully respond and I would, they would fail. Right? And so they would bump again because it was like, well, that's not you. That's not right. <laughs> right? And because I had like unknown for all my fields. And so they'd bump again. And I had both of their information. And I could actually now send them back each other's stuff. Right, so now I'm sending them their legitimate data, but I've again intercepted both of these requests, and now I can alter data too. Uh, and, I, and he goes in deeper. I'm not going to go into this part of it, but he goes into exploit uh, browser bugs by sending a malicious link, and then they click on the link in that contact information, and bad things happen. Right, but these are getting interesting. But you need to understand how some of these backends are packaging up their data so that you can attack them. Uh, you know, the commercial tools out there, not really doing a superb job of this. The, uh, you know, really I, don't, I haven't seen anybody else. We've got our product coming out in February that finally does this. We're able to handle AMF, JSON. Um, so, you know, we can do some of the REST based stuff. And we even kind of have a structure where you can build your own parser. But that's getting, you know, we're, we're finally breaking out. But there's really nobody else doing this stuff yet. Uh, the source code review tools are still very good at helping with this. 
because these are still application problems. Of course, the limitation there is that they end up having a lot of false positives to begin with, and people don't always use them. <laughs> uh, the manual pen testing tools are pretty thin. Most of them don't support this stuff. You know, Daffod with what he's done with Burt Proxy has been great, finally adding support in there. Uh, I saw that Charles Proxy supports this. WS Scanner is very good for the, the SOAP attacks. But it's all very manual, right? It's a, it's a massive effort to audit an application like this. It really takes tons of human time to go through it thoroughly. Uh, the defensive tools, the web application firewalls, they don't understand this traffic, so they just send it through. Right? They don't know how to even really look in them for attack payloads. So they don't understand the format, so they just boop, let it go. Uh, I actually had a call with somebody, and, and they were reviewing our product, and uh, very quickly into the call, we, I, usually what I'll do is I'll ask them to show me their sites, and, and we'll kind of talk about how the tool would, would test their site. And I looked at it, said, oh, we're not going to handle this stuff. Right? It's all AMF traffic. We can't help you right now. Maybe talk to us, you know, February, March. We'll have a, a version that'll help you. But with today's version, can't do anything for you. He's like, really? Why not? And I kind of went through it and explained a lot of this stuff to him. And he said, well, what about the web app firewalls? Actually, I mentioned. I said the web app firewalls aren't going to be able to handle it either. I said, well, I'm on the phone. You know, I've been. I'm actually ready to purchase this WAF, and um, they told me it would work fine. And I said, well, it's not. <laughs> You know, I don't care what they're telling you, it's not going to protect your application. It, they don't have the ability at this point to parse these things and to inspect them. They're just going to forward the traffic. And he's like, well, that's interesting. And then I wished him good luck and, and, and got off the phone with him. And uh, he ended up calling our salesperson back up and, and he got me on the phone. And he said, you saved me like 80 grand <laughs> because I actually told the vendor, I was told it won't work. I need you to prove that it would. All right? And they're like, oh, no, it'll work, it'll work. So he said, you've got to prove it. So they actually brought their appliance out and, and set it up. And, and he tested, he had known vulnerabilities, and he tested them. Right? And the WAF did nothing for any of them. It right? didn't block any of the, the attack payloads. It was totally useless. And so he's like, well, get out of here, you know, and sent them away. But it's just that part of the issue is that they're not being honest about it. Right? And this is a part of the difficulty and the challenge. Um, and I think probably the salespeople didn't understand either. They don't know. There's a, a lack of awareness to the fact that all of this new traffic, all of these new formats, there's not a lot of resources to help. I mean, some of the books, talks like this, were very few. Uh, there's not a lot out there. And, you know, the SDLC helps, but it's often ignored. You know, if, if people are developing their applications in a secure fashion, it'll work, uh, it'll help, but really what's happening is people are just building new stuff very quickly, right? Features are going to keep continue to trump security, and, you know, at some point we've got to figure this out, we've got to help enforce it. You know, the mobile applications, um, you know, I, they're easy to build. I had my son, that was, he's a he was sixth grade going into seventh grade, and his summer project this summer was to build a mobile app. And he's like, well, what am I going to build? I'm like, I don't care. You just got to build something. It has to do something. And he made a little game. Um, but he, he's a sixth grader going into seventh grade. He was able to build a little mobile app. And it, it's really easy. Um, you know, I had to help him a little bit, but nonetheless, he did a good job. Um, but it's really easy. And people are building these things. You see so many apps. And the ones that are turning around and talking to the back end, how many of them have developers that understand how to validate inputs, um, either on the app that's sitting on the phone or when they build their back end to support the thing? All right, I did this with, um, was it Words with Friends? I actually started attacking that. And, and it had two calls. I had one call to, to check the word and another one to submit it. They had to actually broke it into two calls, which was really stupid. And so I was able to ignore, you know, I had a little proxy running, I was able to ignore the, or actually modify it so that it would tell my local words with, prox, uh, words, words with friends that the word was okay, and it would shove it on its screen and send it as its submitted word, and I was sending junk, and my cousin was, I was playing with my cousin, and he's like, that's not a word, how did you do this? But, you know, these backends, they don't understand how to validate input, they're not thinking about it that way. Um, 
you know, so the tool, these new standards are popping up all over the place. People are building their own Rust-based stuff. It's, it's getting crazy and the commercial products are having a very hard time. So I don't have a lot of things to help you solve this problem. I don't really have ways to point you to that. Uh, this trend is going to continue. Uh, you know, hopefully DAST and SAS vendors, you know, like ourselves, hopefully we're going to continue to innovate and start moving into this space and starting to help. Uh, and really the vendors, you know, I kind of pinpoint the defensive tools, but it's not just them, it's also any of the testing tools. We need to be honest with the users about what we can and cannot do. Um, and maybe that's going to help some of these users start to understand, well, maybe we don't want to implement this stuff yet because we can't test it for, you know, the security issues yet. Uh, but if we're going to, then we're going to have to spend the money for professional services to help audit these things. Um, you know, we've been here before. This is exactly what happened with web app, you know, 1.0 stuff. Uh, people jumped into it way before the tools were available. Um, you know, we've been here before. And really, what I'm just trying to do is make people more aware of these issues, of, of the fact that as you start moving forward with these protocols, with these new standards, there's not a lot in the way of security tools to help you defend yourself and, and test these for, for the security issues. So, you know, that's it. Now we're uh, open to questions.